poet David Perry and the founder of the Grattler's Arts Group, who is going to speak about their contribution, uh, this comedy will make the modern British theatre as well as the cast. And please welcome David Perry. just heard Sanan talking about history. Uh, well, I'm, I'm the British side of this, so I think I've got to talk about history as well. Um, we are making history. Oh my God, how often in our lives does that happen? We are making history. We are here this evening to make history in the form of celebrating the work of Mirza Fatali Akundo. Forgive my pronunciation, I do not speak that. Indeed, as I was thinking about how to put this together the other day, I realized it wasn't only a privilege, it was a deep honor to introduce his obvious genius to the British stage. As such, we are certainly making a historical connection between literatures and cultures of very disparate peoples in many ways. To my knowledge, none of his plays have either been read or performed in any European country before. And we, as Gruntlers, have been given the gift of allowing his voice, that is what a playwright seeks to perfect, his voice to speak for the first time in the English language. In fact, this evening is full of gifts. As you will have noticed, we are offering our reading free of charge. Uh, we're doing that primarily as not only our gift to the British Theatre, it is our privilege and gift to present Akundov's work to British Theatre. It is also our gift to the Azerbaijani community in this country uh, for sharing with us their incredibly challenging dramatic treasures. Uh, I have had so much fun talking to Selen recently about authors I have heard by name and never really had access to a great wealth of literature we're going to explore over the next couple of years. And certainly in the case of Akundo, the undercurrents of dialogue, as well as the characters in his comedy, remain highly suggestive. Not to mention, I think, strangely familiar in the land of Shakespeare. Our theatrical tradition is over a thousand years old. To notice some of the people is really quite a treasure for us. After all, poetic gifts are always respected in England, as signs of immensely profound wisdom. Allow me to explain that this is a reading of the play before an invited audience, and not a performance. Indeed, this is a traditional way, it's a fashionable way, to introduce a new playwright, for us he is new, a new playwright to British theatre goers. Only one or two of my fellow grantlers are trained at actors. Therefore, we will be reading from the newly translated scripts in character, while letting Akundov's deeply satirical lines speak for themselves. The only experimental concession, Gruntler's is openly experimental with breaking boundaries, the only experimental concession to the full artillery of an entire staging is wearing full costumes, borrowed from the Republic of Azerbaijan's embassy, very kindly, I will add, throughout our reading. We decided to do this at the last moment, primarily to assist those of you who are unfamiliar with the plot, to follow the events as they unfold. Uh, some of you know the story very, very well, Europeans do not. Therefore, the idea is you can identify who is involved in the dialogue at the exchange and follow the story through. In this respect, we have followed both Ibsen's advice about an uncluttered stage. Keep it nice and simple. Ibsen's advice over and over again. Keep it nice and simple. Along with Stanislavski's rubrics concerning the necessity of drawing on previous personal experience 
in building character on stage. In many ways, we have been walking in the shadows of giants during our preparations. By origin, this theatrical, this theatrical journey started with Sanan Eliev uh, a couple of months ago when he told me that there was a play in Azerbaijan that I would really enjoy. I replied that I would like to read it. He then said there was no English translation, so we had a problem. Three months later, to my surprise and indeed my great delight, this wonderful young man threw down a copy in English before me in a similar way to a challenge. There we are, read that. Um, I'm assuming it's because I'm into weird stuff like spiritualism. I'm, I'm fascinated by those things. And, oh, right, you're like that, you're like that. And I did. I really did. Initially, I picked up the manuscript out of friendship. Eventually, I fell in love with it and agreed to adapt this play for British audiences because I discovered a truly comedic gem. It is a diamond of a play. Unbelievable. Clearly, this is a story of cross-cultural errors, misunderstandings on every side every step of the way. And it's very much, therefore, a tale for our times. As most of you know, the botanist Monsieur Jordan and the sorcerer Dervish Mustali Shah is the narration of a French scholar's plan to take a young Azari man back with him to Paris in order to finish his education. The women in his family oppose this plan very strongly. That's the first thing that caught my attention. This is a woman-centered play. All the most powerful parts of women. Incredibly interesting. Incredibly modern. The women oppose this plan since the young man is due to be married, and they then acquired the dubious services of a dervish claiming to be a magician in order to prevent the young man's departure. On the surface, therefore, <coughs> for a British, for a European audience, this is rather akin to a farce, a comedy of errors. I suspect, I'm really tempted to write a book on this, I suspect, I suspect beneath the jocular glosses lurk very, very, very serious questions about the clash of traditions, a fascinating subject for our time. On that note, I would like to briefly reflect about the form of this play. Clearly, most modern audiences, including reviewers, have come to assume that the stagecraft of a play simply reflects the temperamental choices of a playwright, or is arrived at as an indulgent caprice based normally around the grim realities of funding. The notion that there may be an ideology at work behind the carefully scripted structures of storytelling, even in London, has nearly disappeared. Moreover, any idea that the form of a performance is built on very carefully considered concepts surrounding family, relationships, and much less measurably cultural relationships has become significantly denuded. A sad fact of contemporary theatre. Nevertheless, in a Kundov's case, audiences need to be alert to his subtle juxtaposition of realism with symbolism. For him, as a dramatist inspired by European literary freedoms, the tensions between individual family members inherited cultural expectations, and the flow of historical events creates a platform upon which living symbols unfold. And that is what you're going to watch this evening, the unfolding of a culture clash. Fascinating. In a very acute sense, the whole comedy is an extended symbol. Perspectives little explored since the time of Shakespeare himself, and thoroughly refreshing, refreshing in their revolutionary honesty. All in all, this makes Akundov a startlingly recognisable figure 
an incredibly recognizable presence on the British stage, standing, as he obviously does, alongside the best of our own native realist playwrights. I was looking this afternoon at some of my own books. I'm not really into realism. I think it's too harsh, and I think it loses important dimensions. But I was suddenly reminded by my own book collection that Thomas Reed, in the uh, 1900s, was writing plays very similar to this, and that was a real shock. The language and structures were very comparable, very comparable. I promise to not bore you much longer. To round off, let me stress that we Gruntlers are hoping to stage a full performance of this truly pertinent comedy in the next couple of months. Not simply a stage reading, the full artillery of theatre. In order to do this, we need your gift of further support, along with your applause this evening. Please remember that we are here tonight to honour Akundov as a bard. That is not a word the British throw around at all. That means a master of literature. And I genuinely believe he is a bard. And permit his characters to stride across the London boards as well as speak his words in a European tongue. With this in mind, it's my honour to announce that there will be a book signing after the reading in the bar downstairs, where you can meet all of us. I will be stepping out of this wonderful costume. I want to steal it. I think it suits me. But I will be in my suit afterwards. I'm sorry. Uh, so you can speak to the translator, meet all of us, gossip over glasses of wine, which I love doing myself, and uh, meet the guy that actually started the bridge between our two cultures. I think that's very important. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoy our reading. Thanks, David. <clears throat> now, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you the first act. Karabakh, 1848. It's early spring and the day after the Novos holiday. The scene opens at a winter encampment in Taklamuganda, uh, Lord Adam Khan's room is fully carpeted. To one corner, there are stacked bags of flour. In another corner, there are bladders filled with butter and bells of wool. Seated near the bells, Lady Sharafnisa is combing wool and quietly weeping. Her younger sister, Julesarka, is playing by her side. Who is Victor? 
Whose betrothed? You are. To your cousin, Mr. Chavaz. Whose betrothed do you think he is? Your father, Allah willing, in three weeks' time, is going to hold your wedding, which will be famed throughout the entire Caravan region. Only two days ago, he wrote a letter to his friend, Lord Chavaz of Zardar, to contact the Shaman al musicians so that they can play at the wedding. Ah, uh, what are you talking about, Mum? Shabbos is leaving in ten days. Who's the wedding list my father preparing? I don't know. What? Shabbos is leaving? Where is he going? With whom is he going? What are you talking about? For the sake of Allah, don't invent such tales. Yes, I can see you really were crying, though. It turns out that, in fact, girls have little minds and lots of tears. But tell me, who said to you that Shabbos is leaving? He told me himself. Something like Pakistan, or I don't know exactly, Paris. To hell with them, I can't even pronounce them. But who's he going to Paris with? With our guest, Mr. Jordan. Talk with him, our Frankish, who collects all kinds of brushwood. <laughs> Why is he going there? What dealings does he have with this Frankish man? Did his dog lose its way in Paris? I don't know. Shahbaz is an inexperienced boy. <coughs> Mr. Jordan hammered into his head that girls as well as brides in Paris appear in public with uncovered faces. And lots of other things I don't remember. He became crazy and said that he had to go and see Paris for himself. First, he muttered that he would ask the permission from his uncle. After this, if he didn't get it, he said he would take a horse at night to cross the Aras River and meet Monsieur Jordan on the other side, going with him to admire Paris and see the side. Oh, 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 oh. Jotora, go and call Shabazz here from the other room. Let's hear what his story is. I say to him, Lord, hus Lord Hassan Khan, husband dear, arrange these children a wedding quickly. I'm worried about Shabazz. Every day he has thousands of new fantasies. He didn't listen to me. And now this has happened. What has happened, Auntie? Did you call me? Shabazz, I hear you're going to Frankistan, to Paris. What does this mean? What's wrong if I go, Auntie? I'll go and come back, and we'll even bring a gift of a scalp cap for Sheriff Eason, like the Frankish girls were. I don't need a scalp cap. Buy these hats in Paris, but put them on their girls' head. As they are beings, making it easy for you to fly away from Canada. She's right. Put these hats on Frankish girls. Chef Nisa doesn't need them. Tell me, are you so independent, or do you have Dardia? Who you replaced your father? Of course I have. And I can't go without his, my uncle's permission. Monsieur Jordan will ask his consent. Okay, go. You've completely lost your way. Just go. You've overstepped the boundaries. Go, go, go. I'll call Lord Hatton Carl and we'll ask him who this Monsieur Jordan thinks he is, enticing his nephew to Paris. I swear to Allah, I'll play a game with him. He'll forget Paris along with the way he came. Very well, you go, and I'll talk to Lord Hatton Carl and let him explain to me why you're going to Paris, when your wedding is in 20 days. What? 20 days to my wedding? No. I'm still too young and will not be married so soon. I will not agree to this wedding unless I'm forced to marry. Yes, it is forced. Your wedding should have been more than two years ago, but poor Sheriff Lisa was too small. If young people like you stay unmarried, then it's spoiled bachelorhood falling into theft and robbery. Hungry people fall into theft and burglary. But as for me, thank God I have everything. Oh, that's interesting. What type of hungry people rob and plunder on the road? Don't fantasize for the sake of Allah. You've completely lost your way. Go about your business. Are the Lord Hatton Khan and Lady Sharabun really dead already? Surely some Frankish has confused Shabazz in talking in order to take him away to Paris. Listen, Sarah, please, sir. I have forgotten. What were the promises this straw collector tempted Shabazz with? so as to take him to Paris. I don't know. He says that in Paris, all the pretty girls and young brides appear in public with uncovered faces. But what else did he say? That girls and young brides 
meet with a man, talk with a man, laughing and dancing together. But what else? You've already told me this. Yes, you told me many things, but the other things didn't stay in my mind. I all remember that. What do I know? Oh, great, I laugh. How could I tell Lord Hatton Khan and his nephew, Mr. Shabazz, as he sat in Caravan, kindled tender feelings for Parisian girls, and decided to go there with Monsieur Jordan, leaving his 16-year-old daughter. She, who for no apparent reason, sheds floods of tears and wears mourning cloth, being jealous of Shabazz and the young Parisians. Oh, my Allah, why I'm not dying? What is my own mother saying? It's better if I go. Go. Oh. Good horror. Your father is talking in the courtyard with the shepherds. Go and tell him to come here immediately. There's an important matter to be dealt with. <coughs> what ungrateful people these Frankish are. They remember nothing good. But, but I'm stupid. I'm stupid. Every single day of Allah, I serve Monsieur Jordan breakfast, cream and butter, for dinner, pilaf rice and hot fried lamb, so that when he returned to his homeland, these Frankish people, he wouldn't be able to say that the Caribbean women were rude and unable to entertain their guests. Now, after all this, how can I do a good turn to such people? All my efforts are reduced to ashes. What's happened, woman? Why did you call me so hastily? Well, what else could happen? See for yourself. There's talk that the gatherer of straw, your guest, the man you gave food and drink to, has led your nephew astray and is taking him to Paris. What? But the Jordan is taking Shabazz to Paris. Who said that? I'm saying it. Shabazz himself said it to Sheriff Nisa. Ha, ha, ha. Shabazz knows that your daughter has a sensitive heart, so he must have been joking. And Sheriff Nisa is sad because of this. Ha, ha, ha. Between mother and daughter, you could buy their brains for a penny. Everything trivial you take to yourself. So, everything you say is trivial. Young and inexperienced he may be, but this Frankish man has clouded his head with tempting tales. You're a man. Surely there will not be there will not be blood if you call and speak to both of them about the meaning of all these matters. Well, woman, for the sake of Allah, don't shout. I'll call them this minute and question them by your side. Just don't boil over. Act two. Later the same day. Lord Takan Khan sits at the back of the same room on a carpet. To his right sits his wife, Lady Shahrabano, wearing a white shawl, concealing the lower part of her face. Left of Lord Takan Khan sits Mr. Shahbaz, placing his son on the hilt of a dagger and waiting impatiently for his uncle to speak. On the left side of Mr. Shahbaz sits Mr. Jordan in European dress, bareheaded, having rolled and lighted a cigarette on a rat-covered bell of wolf, crossed leg. The eldest daughter of Lord Hatam Khan, Lady Sharaf Nisa, is uh, hiding behind a curtain, eavesdropping. Lord Hatam Khan turns to Monsieur Jordan. Mr. Doctor, I've heard tales that you are taking our Shabbat to Frankistan. Is it true? Yes, Lord Hatam Khan. I must have wanted to talk with you about this. It's a pity if such a capable and educated young man as Mr. Shabbat will never know the French language. I promised to take him to, to Paris to teach him French and that's something back. He really wants to know the French language and this trip will help him to learn quickly. Even now, talking with me, he has already, already learned a few phrases. Is it true, Shabbat, that you want to go to Paris? Yes, uncle. If I get your consent, I'll go with Monsieur Tadam and then return by myself. But for what reason, my son? To learn the Frankish language, uncle. Why do you need to learn the Frankish language, my dear? You need Arabic, Persian, Azari, and Russian as languages. And you have already studied them at school, as the gifts of our great government. I really need to learn Frankish, uncle. Last year, when you sent me to Tbilisi to obtain permission for digging a water channel, the Son of Lord God gave it, Mr. God gave it, received greater respect than I did, because he studied Frankish in Warsaw. However, Apart from Frankish and Azri, he knows no other language. My son, you are still a child and don't understand all this nonsense. A man needs good sense, but knowing another language will add nothing to your mind. The importance of any language is that a man must, first of all, be able to argue correctly. 
identifying the habits and customs of his time, being able thereby to lead in affairs. One of the, the, one of the people of our time is the inhabitants of Paris. Therefore, uncle, we need to know their customs and manners. Well, it is not a bad thing to know their customs and manners, if you wish to. But how can I know their habits and customs if I can't go to Paris? Very simply, in the way I know them. By having met Monsieur Jordan, listening to the way he speaks, although except for Caraba, I haven't been anywhere else. But, uncle, I don't understand the way in which you can form an idea about the customs and manners of the Parisians. And let me to explain, my dear. It is clear to me that whatever our customs and manners, the Parisians have the contrary. For example, we put henna on our hands, and the Frankish don't. We cut our hair, but they wear wigs. When we sit at home in our hats, they are bareheaded. We wear shoes, yet they wear boots. We eat with our hands and they have spoons. We accept bribes openly, but they take them in secret. <laughs> we believe everything, yet they believe nothing. Our women wear short evening dresses and their women are in long evening dresses. Our custom is to have many wives, but in Paris there are many husbands. <laughs> Uncle, I, I don't understand this. Why don't you understand, my son? Having many wives means that one man is not content with a single woman. Having a lot of husbands means that a woman is not content with one man. <laughs> First is the tradition of our country. The second, the Parisians. Judging, that is, from the contents of the books, which Monsieur Jordan read to us in great detail all winter. Assuming this, you can know everything about them and easily abandon all these useless thoughts of going to Paris. <laughs> oh, Lord Satenka, I wonder how you, as a vicious man, so wise and sensible, so versed in the world the matters, have not yet become a member of any public institution. I can't argue against such reasoning, but with your permission, I would like to say a few words. Oh, certainly, Mr. Doctor. Your words are always pleasant for us. Lord Tottenham, yes. I wanted to take Mr. Chapas to Paris. First of all, I was hoping to personally take care of all his further education, to teach him French and if possible science. Secondly, to present him to our king in order to thank you for your hospitality and for your courtesies. Even to obtain a gift for him from our sovereign, following which I would have sent him back home. After all, I am a botanist and a member of the Academy of Sciences, which is under the personal protection of the King's law and favored by the confidence of His Majesty. Yet, it appears from your words that you deny the death benefits of travel. As such, I deem it necessary to give you examples of its usefulness. If, for instance, I had not come to Karabakh, If I had not come to Karabakh, who would know that in the Karabakh pastures these herbs exist? Until now, doctors and naturalists, naturalists gentlemen like Mr. Linnaeus, Mr. Turnaford, Mr. Bertram, believe that these herbs only grow in the Alpine regions, in America, in Africa, and in the Swiss mountains. But now, after coming to Caucasus, I will prove to Parisian science that all these scholars made mistakes that these plants are widely distributed in the Karabakh region. Moreover, after determining the virtues of these plants and studying the properties of their nature, I will issue a new work, a guide for doctors popularizing these herbs throughout the world. As a case in the point, the grass that you can see here, you can see here, is called in Latin Acanthus, and according to my experiments, it helps stomach pains. Mr. Linnaeus assigns it into in the third category, and Mr. Turnford to the fourth. But I will place in the, it in the second category. Here is a herb called in Latin Ceracitrum alpinum. 
which is efficacious in treating eye diseases, Mr. Lillard has classified this class as belonging to seventh category. Mr. Turner fought in the fourth, but I put it in the tenth category. This herb is called in Cam Camilla Africana. And it's a good remedy for toothache. Mr. Linares places it in the fifth category. Mr. Turner for in the third. But he put it in the eighth category. I, however, I am delighted to have discovered it in the Karabakh Mountains, since it's a great help in curing colds. According to Mr. Linares, it's in the sixth. For Mr. Turner for in the fifth. But I assigned it to the fourth category. Thus, I'll describe both the properties and natures of, of all these herbs and plants anew. Announcing to the entire world for world my researches. After this, our personal reputation in this field will even eclipse the fame of George Clifford, the patron of DNAs. Because my contribution to botany will easily have overshadowed all the achievements of every German scientist who discovered the culture of disease, and in fact rendered an enormous service to their country. I understand absolutely nothing of what you have said, Mr. Doctor. Who is Clifford? Who is Linné? Who is Turner? Why do they trouble themselves by giving categories to plants? And what is Germania? Who is a cartoffel? And from what did he fall ill? And why was he such an important person that his entire homeland was interested in his health and well-being? Oh. Perhaps you want to take our Shabazz away to teach him these riddles. Pardon me, Dr. Khan. You are right. Only now do I understand what kind of, kind of care cases you need. Remember, for example, about a month ago, um, I forget his name, a lucky man came to your, on the back of a rare Karabakh horse and stayed as a guest in your house. If he had not come to Karabakh, how could he possibly have come back? See how clear it is, Mr. Doctor. You are right, and I have to admit it. If he had not arrived in Karabakh, he would never have become rich. Dear uncle, if you also wish me good fortune, let me go with Monsieur Jodin. Such an opportunity will never present itself again. After all, both of you know the benefits of travel. Mr. Doctor, how long would it take for Shabazz to go to Paris and come back? This trip will require a year, not more. If he stays there less than a year, he will not receive all the benefits for which he is going. Because his main aim, to, because his main aim is to learn French. Oh, what shall I do, wife? Let's let him go. Turn your cap around and a year will pass. He is a child wanting to go and see Paris. And Mr. Doctor is a good man. With him, Chabot can learn good manners, experience some ups and downs receive a reward from the king. And by the end of the year, he will be back with us in Carabao. Until this time, we will prepare for his wedding and begin it as soon as he returns. Husband, what are you talking about? Are you out of your mind? I do not want him to go to Paris to learn good manners or to get a present from the king. All these words are excuses. Shabazz only wants to go to Paris to spend his time talking and dancing with girls and young brides who appear in public with uncovered faces. That's all. Stop it, wife. Don't shout for the sake of Allah. What shall I do? Can you stop him? If you can keep a bird from flying across the sky, then you can keep Shabazz here by force. If refused permission, he may jump on his horse and cross the river arrows anyway. Then will I find him? You know how stubborn he is. I too am stubborn. If I will not let him go, if I let Shabazz go to Paris, my headscarf will just be a gypsy's headscarf. How oh, is great. I don't know what guards are going to keep me under house arrest for my aunt. You'll see. You'll do as you like, but I'm going to do my duty. Oh, the work of women is trouble. <laughs> <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, now this is the second half of our play, and please welcome players.
3. The third act occurs in the same room later that day. In one corner of the room sits Lady Shahrabanu. In another corner, Lady Sharaf Nisa conveyed wool. Suddenly, the door opens and Humphrey, none of Lady Sharaf Nisa, enters the room. Salaamu Alaikum. Alaikum Salaam. Humphrey, have you any idea how our conversation ended? At the end of it all, Shabazz is still going to Paris. So I can't do it here to see if you've any ideas that can help us. You know the old Hatton Khan is a soft man, or like dough. He spoke strongly at the beginning, and then suddenly weakened in the face of idle gossip spun by Monsieur Jordan and Shabazz. I would rather die than let Shabazz go to Paris. To be honest, I can't stand seeing Sheriff Nita in tears. And I will not accept Shabazz going to Paris. Just have fun on my rosy-cheeked 16-year-old girl starts to sigh and to cough blood, fading away or, or melting from her sorrow. Oh, my lady, I've already told you there is only one way. Why rely on Lord Hartum Khan or anybody else? Send someone to the neighbouring Ejdabadi village in order to bring Naftali Shah, the dervish, who came from Kizilbash itself, and let him change the situation to your wishes. Ah, I have seen the power of his magic. Oh, if he wants to, he can even divorce me from my husband. Humphrey, <laughs> <laughs> I have heard about the power of his sorcery as well, but I'm still in two minds. Have you heard anything about the spells he has cast? advise me as to whether I should believe in him or not. After all, this situation is a very difficult one. Ah, oh, my lady, didn't he divorce the Ajabali Sergeant Kerem from his wife, Selmanaz, and unite her with her secret lover? Didn't he join old man Safarali's daughter to her lover in Mungali village, as well as kill her father with his magic because he didn't want to marry of them? Oh, no. Didn't this dervish bring back the husband of Shah Sinem, who was the daughter of uh, Gabalai Gamba from Jabadi village? <laughs> After an entire year, without him even marrying a second wife, oh, nothing can escape from his magic. Oh, all right, my dear Hanbury. Send your son, Ali Madan, this very moment to bring the star to Shah from Ajabedi village. Let him say that Lady Sharaban has called him and promises him whatever he wishes. In short, by the time the lights are lit this evening, the Starly Shah should be in our house. Oh, yes, my lady, I'll send for him now. Mm, but it is better if neither Lord Hatam Khan nor Mr. Shafaz knows that the Starly Shah is coming here. Allah oh, forbid! If Mr. Shahbaz should see him here, he will kill the sorcerer. And he won't leave me alive either. <laughs> <laughs> no, but of course, I know how weak they are. Now, I'll go now and send Lord Hatton Khan with Shabbat to tend to the herd. And we'll say when they return that they should sleep in, sleep in Sheriff Nisa's room because I need to warm up some water in order to wash her hair. You go now and send your son for the dervish. Thank you, Allah, for your mercy. Thank you, Allah, for your mercy. My heart has calmed down. Let that country disappear. Where there is no magic or sorcery. Without the dervish recommended by my nanny, Mr. Jordan will take on turf and take the Shafas with him and leave me in the march. Sheriff Nisa, my darling, did you hear about the stones that are planted today? In front of Mr. Jordan, she shouted at Uncle and threatened me. Undoubtedly. You are blind to what you are doing and only see your auntie shouting? What have I done, my dear Shafas? Shafas, who gave me these pictures? Didn't you bring them to me saying, look, Parisian girls and brides, see how nice they are? These girls and brides sit in public places with their faces uncovered alongside of men. Didn't you show them to, I, I didn't show them to your auntie because I was ashamed. Oh, 
how can you speak like a child? These pictures were inside Monsieur Jardin's books. While flipping through them, he saw these pictures and gave them to me. Take this, he said, and show them to the daughter. This year, the girls and brides of Paris are wearing dresses such as these. Last year, they were wearing different ones. Next year, they will dress quite differently again. Since each year in Paris, they change their manner of dress. I give these pictures to you. What's the problem with that? The problem is that you want to go to Paris and find where they win. What are you saying, Terapnisa? I would sacrifice all the girls of Paris for one hair of your head. I have such a beautiful betrothal. I wouldn't even look at the horries in paradise. I can't live a single day without you. If you love Allah, stop it. There is no need to trick me. If you really can't live a day without me, you wouldn't go to Paris. You just don't love me. How can you distrust me so, Teresa? It would be better if you had pierced my heart with an arrow than saying these things to my face. Why didn't you ask me for my reasons to come to Why should I ask you? I know your reasons very well. Here are your reasons. I swear to Allah, no. These are not the reasons. You don't know. All my peers are courtly, giving service, and are well respected. They have authority. As for me, I have no authority, and I'm stuck in this hole. First, that's a lie. Four months have ever been made a happy by either course of manners or service. Happy people find joy in different ways. Secondly, if you want to do a service, go to Tbilisi and serve there. Then, if you want to go to other cities, while remaining in hands rich, but no one goes or indeed comes all the way back from Paris. You're right. Although in each case a person must have their will to. In Tbilisi, as in other cities, no one knows me. Who is there to support and help me? To find a post that will inspire the respect of others? This Frankish is a very good person who loves me and is intimate with our family. I'll be respected because of going to Paris to learn the Frankish language and be presented to the king. When I come back, there will be a position for me everywhere. This is just an excuse. You want to deceive me. How could it that such a young and clever boy can find a position in Tbilisi? After returning from Paris, of course, I will go to serve in Tbilisi. How can young, such a young boy like you to defend himself in Paris from this loose woman? and return home behaving like an honorable man. You will never go to Paris. If you do, you can bust them. Act 4. Later in the same room, Lady Sharabano is sitting to one side, while Lady Sharabnisa and her nanny Hampari are sitting on the side of her. It is two hours after sunset. Lady Sharabano raises her head and turned to Hampari. Well, where is he, Hampari? Our dervish hasn't arrived yet. Oh, don't worry, my lady. He will come soon. Salam, my lord. Alaikum salam. Father dervish, you're welcome. Come and sit. What service do you want from me, lady? With all my heart, I'm ready to fulfill any of your commands. Hmm. Well, Father Dervish, I'm troubling you because of a small problem. In a nutshell, our Shabazz is completely out of hand. We have a Frankish guest with whom he wants to go to Paris, leaving his betrothed, my beautiful daughter, in tears and grief. Yet in a mere 20 days their wedding is to be held. But both myself and Lord Hatton Khan have asked and begged him not to go, but he hasn't listened to either of us. You have to do something so that our Shabazz can't go to Paris and Monsieur George Allen gives up the idea of taking him away. Lady, this is not a small problem. On the contrary, it's a very large and a very complex problem. To accomplish this task, it may be necessary that the power of my magic rain down either on Paris or Monsieur George Allen himself. Yes, but I don't understand, Father Dervish. What do you mean that the power of your magic must rain down, either on Paris or Monsieur Jordan? Lily, for example, 
In order to influence Mr. Shabazz, I would have to infest one of my genes within him. In its turn, the gene will remove any desire to go to Paris on his head. However, Mr. Shabazz may be so afraid of the gene that it will affect his head, or make him go sick, or become lame because he's still a child. Oh, no, 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 for our sake, Father Dervish, don't speak in this way. Our plans are simply to keep Shabazz at home, always in front of our eyes. How can we possibly agree that a gene infests him? In that case, I'll have to command my ogres and my witches to destroy Parish. <laughs> Turn it upside down so that Mr. Shabazz abandon his desire to go there. <coughs> or if need be, command the planet Mars to decapitate Mr. Shabazz. <laughs> Leaving him no one to take Mr. Shabazz to Parish. There are no other ways to help him. Are these things possible, Father Dervish? Can we do them? <laughs> oh, don't doubt this thing, Zeliri. <laughs> this is my business. <laughs> Have you not heard that I ordered some demons to wreak continual havoc in the Shusha castle betwixt the various sect of mullahs and sheikhs, hmm? giving them no peace? Huh? This was due to the fact that these mullahs openly encouraged people from their pulpits not to believe in wizards and sorcerers. Also, did I not transplant the Jin Giljan into the body of the son of Lord Veri, making the inhabitants of Skill Village so afraid of him that they could not either sleep by night nor by day in their own homes? And even that is not enough. After all, last year, they did not let me into Salian Village, proclaiming that the inhabitants of their city were palace, whereas I was only a dervish and a sorcerer. However, in these magical disputes, I am uncertain which great works to tell you. Please bear in mind that they are only my most recent miracles. Looking back uh, 11 years ago, I arrived on the bank of the river Araz, passing through the Nakjibyan and Sharu regions to go to Erevan. Residents in both of these areas prevented me from crossing, saying, we won't let you pass because you don't have permission. Huh? The law in this area prohibits strangers and people without authorization from passing along this route. And it's well known that they themselves assist and guide swindlers and smugglers to go there and back again without any documentation. Hmm. How often do I beg them to let me cross? but they always refuse to listen. In which case, I went down the river and up again, although I couldn't find any means of transport. Consequently, I became very, very angry and ordered my ogres and my witches to spend this time to abandon his intention of taking Mr. Shabazz away with him. Or, taking a large cockerel, and naming him Mr. Shojan, I will immediately cut off his head. For in this, I will order the planet Mars to decapitate the real Mr. Shojan in ten days' time. This will result in saving Mr. Shabazz from the Frenchman. Be good to instruct me, Your Majesty. As to whether I destroy Paris or Oh, do both of them, Grandfather. Do <laughs> oh, You may feel sorry for the friends. He is saying, Anne Marie, is your heart made of stone? What wrong have the wrong poor Parisians done to us that we need to bring down their homes on their heads, killing thousands and thousands of people? This brushwood collector, Monsieur Jordan, has brought all these troubles to us. Monsieur Dervis, do to him whatever you want. <laughs> Cut the rooster's head clean off and tell the planet Mars to strike the neck of Monsieur Jordan when he crosses the river Arras. Then Shabazz will be alone and return back to us. It's better that one guilty man dies than thousands of innocent people. Mother dearest, don't say this. 
pity Mr. Jordan. He is a good man. All summer long he made bouquets for me from rare flowers. He and Chef passed each day to give them to me and ask if I ever seen them in all these years I walked through the meadows. He also presented me with a mirror which had drawn in its back. The most amazing flowers brought from New World and growing in Korea selected Parisian gardens. He loves me like a daughter. I would rather kill myself than see Mr. Jordan beheaded. Let Paris disintegrate. Why should we care? If girls in bright would walk around there with their uncovered faces, Shafas would never even think of going there. Let all of Paris fall apart, as well as there all the girls in bright die. <laughs> well, I really don't, I don't know what to do. I really don't know what choice to make. What should I do? Sheriff, no. Sheriff Neeson's right. Poor Monsieur Jordan. He's a good man, being guilty of only one thing, seducing Shabazz's brain with daydreams of Paris. Yet it's clear there are lots and lots of bad people in Paris. Maybe fate has sent us this dervish to destroy such a city and reduce it to ruins by his magic. For the dervish, order the ogres and witches to lift and overturn Paris. Indeed, lady. My friend, you go out and say to my pupil, Colonel Mali, that he needs to take the saddlebags from my horse and bring it here. <clears throat> yeah. Where is Lord Patton found? And Mr. Shabazz? In an adjoining room. They came back from inspecting the third earlier, and they are sleeping. Lady. Yeah. With regards to this mystery, we do not need to know a thing. Neither they nor anybody else. Neither now or afterwards. Oh, no, no, no. Otherwise, the spell will have no effect. Right. Well, to this end, rest assured, Father David. Salaam alaikum. Alaikum salam. What do you mean? To... Put, put, put the saddle bags down and take out from the blocks of wood with the pictures. What do you intend to do? What do you speak Persian? What do you intend to do? I want to make a model of Paris. Once I have done it, I will destroy it in front of this woman. I instruct my ogres and witches to turn the real Paris upside down in a twinkling of an eye. For what reason? For the hundred brand new gold coins that I will receive from the mistress of this enterprise. Okay, but what grudge does this woman harbour towards the Frankish capital and its people? Oh, it's a long story, my friend. I have no time to tell you about it now. Get the blocks from the saddlebags now. This very minute? But it makes no sense. Are you kidding? What do you mean by saying Paris will be destroyed? Why don't you understand? This venerable lady will pay me a hundred brand new gold coins for this undertaking. And we have a full ten days from these magical moments to occur. No one knows who will ever know our little secret. Huh? As soon as I get the gold, I will be gone from here. I can cross to the other side of the river Arise in about ten days. Okay. And who will find me there on the other side? Come there what may, if in ten days Paris is coincidentally destroyed and ruined, <laughs> this gold will be in my well rewarded pocket. Huh? <laughs> After all, in this life, how can anyone know what would happen next? Possibly Paris will actually be destroyed for some reason or another at this time. Mm -hmm. The world is full of uncanny events. Your last point remains absurd. It's just a delusion. In that case, explain our last joke. What is it about a delusion? Ah, oh, yes, in fact, there's no doubt. Don't try to befuddle me with your useless speculation. Go to the horses and wait for me. I will finish my work here in an hour and then come to you afterwards. We will ride away together. And Hunter, close the door so that no one can enter here. These women are, are exceptionally naive and simple minded. With neither hesitation nor thought, they believe that. While sitting in Karabakh, <laughs> I can destroy Paris in a moment. 
or I can stand on the planet Mars and take off the head of Monsieur Jordan on the opposite bank of the river Paraz. <laughs> uh, Monsieur Valdemir, what are you saying? Uh, uh, I am conjoined with conspiracy, lady. Um, lady, for a magic to be successful, I am trying to let the orders and the witches know what I am. Paris. Indeed, they can't rest unless they are doing evil. 
After all, if there were no devil, there would be no evil in the world, and nobody would have been tempted the descendants of Adam into the Oh, clearly, clearly, Father Lynch. But how much of a reward should be given to the workers? I don't want more than the sum agreed. A hundred four points. Oh, is that not too much, Father Dervish? <clears throat> Why, Ned, you are forcing me to destroy an entire city worth thousands and thousands of coins? And I'm complaining that 100 gold coins will be too much. Sheriff Nisa, my daughter, bring me the little casket. Look, my dear, there is so little money left for your wedding. Don't worry, Mom. We'll sell one or two hundreds of lamps and there will be money again. <laughs> Truly, my child. It's better to lose your nose and ears than your head. Here we are, Father Dervish. Aha! It turns out that the city of Paris is ruled by the constellation Scorpio. Everything is clear. It is due to the influences of this constellation that disasters never go away from this city. Ladies, do not be afraid. Keep your heart strong. Dagda aha patandi. Tubal kara karandi. Tubal kuma kumuha. Bindi yandi yandi. Now destroy this likeness. Ha! Congratulations, <laughs> dear. Paris is now destroyed. Are you satisfied? Oh, yes, Father Dervish, I'm very pleased. <laughs> if only the news about the destruction of Paris can quickly be given to Monsieur Jordan, he will then leave Shabazz here. But I don't know who could deliver such news about Paris to us so quickly. <laughs> if a person can stand here from destroy Paris in the middle, uh -huh. if a person can stand here and destroy Paris in a blink of an eye, surely he can make someone deliver such news in a minute, an hour, a day, or even ten days concerning this. Well, of course you're right, Father Dervish. It would be splendid, however, if this news came to Monsieur Jordan right now. We would immediately. Don't tell them, come. Mr. Chapas, open the door. Oh, oh, oh my heavens. Oh, mother. Oh. <laughs> Where's Don't tell them, come. Where's Mr. Chapas? He's in the other room. He's in the other room. He's in this room. They, they went to check on the herd, and they're both sleeping as if they came home very, very tired. They went to bed early this evening. They did. You must wake them up immediately. I need to go. I can't stay for an instant. It's a poor party. Whereas I pity the beautiful capital city, the beautiful kid. First I suffered a great misfortune. Too much party. What a wonder. What's happened to this doctor? Paris is destroyed. Versailles is in ruins. France is not lost. Too much party. Too much Versailles. Thank you, girl. <laughs> 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 kingdom. In a moment, it has been raised. The mind boggles. What has caused this? What is the sorcery? What's that, bro? Monte, Monte. What? what? Sorcery? Has Paris been destroyed by magic, Monsieur Jordan? Of, what did you say? Of course, my sorcery. It's quite beyond belief. In a moment, Paris has been destroyed. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, no, no. Oh, oh, you're here. Lord Zetan God. Mr. Shabbos, for the sake of the Creator, quickly give me a horse. I must leave immediately. 
I cannot think of, please help me to cross the rivers of Himur and us. What's happened, Mr. Doctor? Why are you leaving so quickly? Paris is in ruins and Persia is destroyed. Our French kingdom has died. The king has escaped and I've just received a letter from the British consul in Tabriz. The consul has reported on this catastrophic event and says that a courier is going back to London with important papers. He'll be waiting for me on the bank of Tarras. In 12 hours, I must be there. If I miss the courier, he will leave that and I cannot abandon the king. Louis Philippe has fled to England on, on the Monde. Mr. Doctor, who destroyed Paris? Who turned it into ruin? I don't know. Devils, orcs, witches, villains? What else shall I call, call them? A revolution has happened. I beseech you, Lord Tetemka. Prepare the horses. No more delays. Tomash, buddy. First sire, Monde, set up. Oh, I did I swear for Allah, this is me. I swear by the Holy Quran. I swear for all my ancestors, I'm innocent. I haven't done nothing. <laughs> Just look how she swears at trying to shield herself. Why are you trembling? A queen of beauty such as you is allowed to destroy Parish. Mr. Doctor, are you still taking our Shabazz with you? What are you saying, lady? I do not know where to lay my own head, let alone how to escort Shahbazi. Instead, I beseech you, Miss Lord Atanka, to ride the horses and accompany me. Before noon, I need to be on the other bank of the earth. Well said, on the, on the... Come on, Shabazz, let's see what can be done. What a great misfortune. Tamperee, did you see how everything has been sorted out? Well, didn't I say, my lady, that nothing escapes from this dervish's power? I am also afraid that the magic he used to destroy Paris mm, can affect other cities as well. <laughs> After all, didn't the dervish say that the terrible forces he mustered to ruin the Najaban and Sharu regions equally caused pieces of... Mount Ararat to fall on nearby villages. Yes, yes. And none of this is surprising. Following all that's happened here, it's remarkable that men tell us women not to believe in sorcery. <laughs> How can people not accept what they see with their own eyes? <laughs> oh, my lady. If men had any brains, how could we manage to deceive them at every step of the way? and get what we want in the manner we do. <laughs> <laughs>
I would like now to invite our last performers for our stage, uh, Babek, Tabrizli, and Kubra Inal. Please welcome.
Simon Pauli for allowing us to use this theater. Last but not least, the Grapplers will be launching a new collection of poetry by Nigel Humphreys as the Poetry Cafe on 30th of this month. Why not to join us? And lastly, we'll be holding a book signing of this play in the, uh, in the bar downstairs where you can have a glass of wine and meet performers as well as the excerpts from the film version of this play along with the modern Azeri musicians. Thank you very much. Just before you go, I present you the real star of the evening, our translator, Mr. Salin Aliyev. A round of Thank you. 